Welcome to History Happy Hour. The goal of this program is to educate, inspire, and entertain with a pint-sized historical tale and about the time it takes to drink a glass of beer, or root beer, or whatever you feel like. Let me qualify this program by saying I'm not a historian nor an expert, but I look for publicly available resources to provide a 30 minute or less informational program on history in our shared community. And with that being said, History Happy Hour tonight will scratch the surface on winter festivals in Ely. Before I go on, I'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsors and supporters, the Boathouse Brew Pub, which hosts this event for free. The Ely Folk School and Boundary Waters Connect and the Ely Heritage Preservation Commission and of course the Dorothy Moulter Museum, which helps support my time in researching and providing this program. So let's dive in. With up to nine months of the year experiencing snowfall, Minnesotans have had a lot of time, much of it in the dark, to develop winter diversions to both find joy in the cold and help pass the time. Because if you can't find joy in the cold and usually snow, you still have the same amount of cold and snow, but no joy. So why not create a whole celebration about it? Before we jump into Ely's own winter festival, let's take a step back and broaden our perspective. Although Minnesota was the first state in the nation to start a winter celebration with an ice castle and carnival, it was Empress Anna Ivanovna of Russia who built the first ice castle, based on the written word that is, in 1739. Technically, the palace and the surrounding festivities were part of the celebration of Russia's victory over the Ottoman Empire. However, it inspired others. The city of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, has had a long tradition having a midwinter celebration to the history of colonial New France when family and friends would gather in January to mid-February to break the boredom and deep freeze of winter. They took up ice castle making in 1883, but their winter carnival quickly disbanded in 1885. Wah, wah. However, the St. Paul Winter Carnival in Minnesota debuted in 1886 after several Eastern newspaper correspondents visited St. Paul in the fall of 1885. Upon returning home, they reported that Minnesota, in general, was another Siberia unfit for human habitation. A group of business owners decided they would not take these comments lightly and retaliated by creating the Wintertime Festival in 1886, which would showcase all the beauty of Minnesota winters. Conveniently, Montreal had an ice castle architect free, and St. Paul hired him. St. Paul's longtime tradition remains the oldest winter festival in the United States, predating the Tournament of Roses Festival by two years, which was what began Pasadena, California's effort to promote the city's charm and beautiful weather of the Mediterranean of the West to those very same East Coasters for a midwinter holiday. Also, Quebec got back into the game and now boasts the largest winter carnival in the Western Hemisphere. Fun fact, Harbin, China is the leader in the world for their ice and snow festival every January, where in December, 15,000 people spend two weeks building sculptures which are on display until the thaw sets in, and then everyone is invited back to help chop down the sculptures with axes. Perhaps this could be a new event at the Ely Winter Festival next year, uh, maybe with a little added insurance. With time and imagination, celebrations of winter all over grew and evolved to include coronations of all types. Here in Minnesota, the Vulcan crew, that's crew with a K, of the Order of Fire and Brimstone elected a fire king, the Vulcanus Rex, or the Volk the true king of the St. Paul Winter Festival, or so they claimed. But of course, Ely, Minnesota would also implement ways to celebrate the winter and hold it up as the superior season of the North. Based on archives of the Ely Minor, the earliest wintertime carnival was held in 1896, but it was specifically a Christmas carnival. The earliest mention of a non-holiday but winter-focused event 
was in 1911 for Ely's Ice Carnival. In 1922, the American Legion coordinated a winter carnival that included a variety of winter sporting events, including dog sled races, skating races, and a hockey game, all complete with prizes of cash, knives, watches, candy, and for the young ladies, 9 to 12 years old, a bottle of perfume. In the 1950s, there appeared to be a great many events during the Winter Carnival in Ely, including coronation of Ely Winter Carnival Queens. Well-attended ice fishing contests with, of course, amazing prizes. This GMC truck was first prize and the washing machine, likely the second prize, which is in the bed of the truck. Awarded by that year's Winter Carnival Queen, Celeste Holmes. And similar to today, other events began to be added to the festivities, including indoor events. In 1957, Aunt Jemima visited Ely on a marketing trip to serve the American breakfast brand for pancake mix, table syrup, and other breakfast food products, but specifically pancakes. Aunt Jemima was modeled after and has been a famous example of the, quote, mammy stereotype in the southern U.S. with historical ties to the Jim Crow era that, for obvious reasons, was discontinued in late 2020. It is likely that the woman playing the Aunt Jemima character in this news clipping was Rosie Lee Moore Hall from Texas. Her job was to travel the country and make pancakes for events and promote the products. In 1969, a group of individuals and organizations gathered to discuss ways to promote winter recreation in Ely, and with some help from the North Star Sled Dog Club from the Twin Cities, they developed and launched the All-American Championship Sled Dog Race in January of 1970. By 1982, the great success of this race led the mayor of Ely to pro proclaim Ely as the dog sled capital of America. This momentum helped build up Ely as a winter destination, and in 1984, the Ely Ski Club, now, now known as the Ely Nordic Ski Club, started a cross-country ski race. The Wilderness Trek Ski Race started from Hidden Valley to Tower, but within a few years, it shifted to start in Tower and included a longer 50K race from the city of Tower to Hidden Valley, and a shorter 30K race starting at Bearhead Lake State Park. The longer race was a qualifier for the Birkbeiner Ski Race in Wisconsin. Using the Taconite Snowmobile Trail and with support from numerous volunteers, it operated much like the Wolf Track Classic and Ely Marathon do today. Local businesses and craftspeople set up booths at the finish line of the race with food and live music eventually added to the festivities. In 1988, residents and volunteers, Bill and Gloria Miller, began to mold the race into a festival event. The finish line was moved to 4th Avenue and Harvey, just outside of Ely School's JFK cafeteria. A Voyager encampment demonstration was outside and indoors. Spectators and vendors would watch from the windows while enjoying concessions, a craft fair, and student art displays. The skiers competing also received a complimentary meal. This finish line festival quickly grew into a three-day Voyager weekend event, promoting outdoor activities and education about the history of the Ely area and included a spaghetti feed, the ski race with finish line fest and an awards ceremony. In summer of 1993, the Millers coordinated with local businesses, clubs, organizations, schools, and government to grow Voyager's Week into a 10-day event. Activities slated for this celebration included the Wilderness Trek Ski Race and Finish Line Festival, Voyager Dance, which was the first muckluck ball, kids cross-country races, ski joring races, golf games on ice, a choir concert with singers from Northland College, the first snow sculptures, Several guided snowshoe trips by Outward Bound, snowshoe races, a cabaret, ice fishing contests, wolf howling with the International Wolf Center, wild game tasting, Dorothy Moulter program and snowmobile ride, scenic flights by the Ely Airport, 
a bridge tournament, trip to Giants Ridge, skiing at Whiteside Park, ski jumping exhibition and or competitions, and broom ball. When the event finally happened, it had been coined the Voyager Winter Festival, complete with a snow sculpting symposium and the first commemorative pin. Like many large events, they can be overwhelming. And at times, especially with winters like we've had this year, eventually the ski race was canceled and the snow carving symposium became the main attraction for the festival. In 1998, the Ely Art Walk was created to promote Aleria artists and their work by providing exhibition space in the storefront windows around town. Today, over 400 pieces of original art in all mediums are visible with much of it for sale. In 2007, the Voyager Winter Festival changed, but in name only, and took on the new name Ely Winter Festival. Many arts and cultural events Snow sculpting symposiums, spaghetti feed, educational opportunities, outdoor endeavors, and enthusiasm for winter still remain. The Ely Winter Festival is the largest in size and event offerings in Ely, and some argue the best. Something like this cannot be pulled off without funding from grants and donations, a dedicated group of volunteers, and impressive in-kind support by local businesses, especially lodging and food services. The bulk of the expenses revolve around the snow sculpting symposium, including a dedicated fund for snow. Did you know that they have money so that if there's not enough snow, they can get snow plowed on Shagwa Lake and hauled over to the park? The Ely Winter Festival makes every effort to work with local organizations and businesses to plan and create activities during the 10-day festival so that visitors can fill each day with a different activity, learning opportunity, or event. And I'd say they do a pretty darn good job, too. Stay tuned for next month's version of History Happy Hour, which will be held the second Wednesday of the month on March 13th, and will feature... St. Urho's Day. And as always, we encourage you to go to the Ely Trivia Night, which is the second Thursday of the month, because those of you who are here at History Happy Hour have a leg up because there is typically at least one question in the trivia related to our History Happy Hour topic of the month. Again, I'd like to make special thanks to um organizations and individuals that I was able to obtain photographs and resources from. Of course, the Ely Winter Festival, specifically Linda Gannister, Ely Winton Historical Society, Northern Lakes Arts Association, Ely Art Walk, Ely Echo, Paul Pelkola, Ed DC, St. Paul Winter Carnival, Dolly Putzel Lindrus, Wolf Trek Classic, Minnesota Historical Society, Harbin Ice and Snow Fest of China, and all of our lovely supporters and sponsors that make this event possible. 